Hey guys, Tyler here. Zebes is one of the most interesting alien planets in all of sci-fi. The terrestrial setting of the original Metroid game, its remake Metroid Zero Mission, and Super Metroid, this iconic world has gone on to inspire countless locations in other media. Orbiting the yellow star FS-176, Zebes is considered to be inhospitable to traditional Earth-like organic life. And yet, as we learn, the famed bounty hunter Samus Aran was raised here by members of the bird-like Chozo species, who made Zebes one of their colony worlds. And when Samus returns to the planet to fight Metroids, the Space Pirates, and Mother Brain, we see an assortment of other strange enemies that live both on the surface and in underground caverns. In this video, I'd like to guide you on a tour of planet Zebes, cataloging the various flora and fauna Samus encounters in both of the games set in this brutal biosphere. Let's get started. Before we begin exploring the various sectors of Zebes and the life that thrives in them, it's important to establish some more astronomical and geological information about the planet itself. According to Metroid Prime, at least 85% of Zebes's crust is composed of Earth. Er, oh, fuck me. Earthic ore. <laughs> According to Metroid Prime, at least 85% of Zebes's crust is composed of earthic ore, a very dense, nearly indestructible material with a high melting point that is nevertheless vulnerable to concussive detonations. Given Zebes's mass and radius, or just over 80% that of Earth's, it's reasonable to conclude that this denser crust gives Zebes a slightly higher surface gravity, around 1.36 g. It has an atmosphere that is similar enough in composition to Earth's nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere that Samus can breathe here without her power suit. And Prime also shows that Zebes has two moons. We don't know a lot about Zebes's parent star, FS-176, but we can deduce some of its properties, which will tell us quite a bit about the life on Zebes's surface. Prime tells us that Talon 4, another planet located in the FS-176 system, orbits 778 million kilometers or 483 million miles from the primary star. This is equivalent to just over five astronomical units, or about the radius of the planet Jupiter's orbit around our sun. Assuming Talon 4 is too large to be the moon of a gas giant and heated by tidal forces, FS-176 would need to have a luminosity over 10 times that of our sun to possess a habitable zone large enough to fit both Zebes's and Talon 4's orbits. The first area that Samus encounters in Metroid is called Brinstar. It consists of many tunnels and caverns, chiefly composed of blue, orange, and green rock, hence its designation as the Rocky Zone. Relatively easy to navigate, Brinstar is teeming with life and contains pools of dangerous acid. Super Metroid divides Brinstar into two areas, Upper and Lower Brinstar, each with their own distinct appearance and musical theme. <laughs> Star is home to more than 60% of Zebes' wildlife, including a dense forest, yet the vegetation does not have anything to photosynthesize. It's been speculated the plants only need water or are primarily carnivorous, both traits that have a basis in real floral behaviors. On the other hand, Brinstar plants might be chemosynthetic, deriving energy by converting inorganic compounds to organic ones through oxidation. Or, given Brinstar's cavernous environs, these funky-looking plants could actually be fungi, distributing nutrients through some sort of mycelial network. The mycelial network. Like Mycelial network! Either way, it's life, but not as we know it. Such plants include walking cacti, the carnivorous tangle vine, a sarlacc looking ass thing called a samus eater, and of course, the genetically engineered spore spawn. Definitely my favorite boss in the game. Get out of morphal form. Shit! Ugh. 
in Zero Mission, Samus also encounters many spherical, shelled, and spiky creatures, as well as several flying fauna. Many of these dive bomb Samus as she makes her way through the caverns of Brinstar and fill niches of beasts like bats, as you'd expect in such an ecosystem. Insectoid animals also populate this region, ranging from small buzzing and swarming bugs Samus can farm for health, to giant ones that she encounters as mini-bosses. An example of the latter is a segmented thorny cyclops worm that awards Samus with Charge Beam. But one of the most recognizable Metroid enemies is the Ripper, which lazily floats back and forth and is best known for its near invulnerability to damage. They have a brown, turtle-like shell, which Samus can stand on as a platform. It's at this point that I should point out giant insects were once possible on Earth, but their size is limited by Earth's present oxygen concentration, which used to be higher. It's likely that Zebes has a higher oxygen concentration in its atmosphere as well. Crade's Lair is a sub-area of Bryn Star, and it has its own unique flora and fauna. Samus encounters more insect-like life that swoops above and below and spawns from pipes. But one of the most notable new encounters is a large enemy called a Sidehopper. Possessing piston-like legs, two mandibles, and giant eyes, these fellows defy gravity throughout this area and have many cousin species that live on different parts of the planet. And guarding Kraid's room is also the Gadara, a scaly, spiky enemy identifiable by their singular large eye, a mainstay of boss encounters across multiple Metroid games. Having said all this, though, the main attraction in this area is definitely Kraid himself, a three-eyed reptilian space pirate. During iconic boss fights across the games, Kraid towers over Samus and shoots dagger-like spikes from his stomach and spinning claws from his hands, infinitely regenerated by his body. I should also clarify that the space pirates aren't a singular species. They're an interstellar organization consisting mainly of genetically engineered creatures with lobster-like claws and exoskeletons. I haven't made a video about them or their dragon-like leader Ridley on this channel yet since, well, there's not much more to their biology than that, but naturally they're an important part of the Metroid saga and a constant adversary of the Galactic Federation. Norfair represents the fiery underground caves of Zebes. Much of its natural environment consists of volcanic caverns, with some containing glass bubbles that melt and drip from the ceiling like stalactites. The fire sea boasts incredibly high temperatures, and Samus can only explore portions of it with a various suit. Even the life here is on fire, which might seem absurd, but believe it or not, there's actually a real type of organism that not only lives but thrives in extreme environments. Extremophiles. Typically, these are single-celled bacteria or archaea, but some fungi fit into this category as well. Their habitats push the limits of what known life can adapt to, such as extreme temperature, radiation, salinity, or pH level. For instance, the bright colors of the Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park are produced by thermophiles that survive in the 160 degree Fahrenheit boiling lake. As recently as 2019, scientists even discovered sulfur-breathing organisms that live 7,900 feet below the surface of a Canadian mine. What's interesting to note is that, given the definition of an extreme environment is relative, particularly to our anthropocentric standard, extremophiles can be considered to be ecologically dominant in the history of our planet. Some spores and samples of cocooned bacteria have been dormant for more than 40 million years, and indeed, the earliest types of life that we have evidence for were entirely anaerobic, as Earth's atmosphere lacked oxygen until 2.2 billion years ago. Some bacteria have been found in the Marianas Trench and in cold, dark lakes half a mile under Antarctica. The presence of microbes in frigid Antarctic deserts, exposed to harmful UV radiation, high salt concentration, and low mineral concentration suggests similar microbes could reside under the Martian surface and on other extraterrestrial bodies. A key to these microbes' adaptations is their amino acid composition, affecting how proteins in their DNA fold under certain conditions. 
Notably, however, Norfair's extremophiles are more multicellular than extremophiles that have been cataloged on Earth, as in addition to the weird fireball enemies we've encountered so far, many of the area's life forms resemble insects, seahorses, owls, and dragons. And of course, there's the mini-boss Krokemeyer, which rewards Samus with Grapple Beam and Super Metroid. Criteria is mountainous and rocky, containing many caves to explore, and it has very little vegetation besides some tall mushrooms, grass, and other small plants. After Turian's destruction in Zero Mission, Samus's landing site is constantly drenched in acid rain. In Upper Criteria, several pools of water and scalding hot lava can be found, the latter presumably having reached the surface through a volcano created by tectonic activity. And yet, along with Brinstar, Criteria is the only place on Zebes where humans can naturally survive unaided by technology or biological augmentation, indicating the presence of a breathable atmosphere. It's only with the infusion of Chozo DNA that Samus is able to survive in other areas of Zebes. It's also here that Samus encounters large, aggressive fish called Skulteras, and in a partially submerged area called the Wrecked Ship, she fights the cephalopod-like Fantoon that feeds off raw energy. But besides these examples of more familiar fauna, Criteria still boasts some off-the-wall life forms like floating plant enemies, more spiky boys, seemingly artificial energy-based spheroids, and a toothy gliding fellow called a, a chute. Sh shoot? A major aquatic area of Zebes is Meridia, which is a pain in the ass to fully navigate unless Samus has acquired the gravity suit upgrade. The base of Meridia is connected directly to the most remote parts of Brinstar by a transparent glass tunnel that can be shattered with a power bomb. This subsection consists of green-tinted stone and some of the same aquatic creatures that inhabit the surface of Criteria near the wrecked ship. A few space pirates who wear special aquatic gear can be found here, and only a small amount of technology has been integrated into the environment. A sandier subsection of Meridia is more heavily integrated with space pirate tech and artificial structures, and is riddled with quicksand. Samus notably encounters a waterborne crustacean boss called Dragon in this sector, which rewards Samus with the space jump ability, as well as the aquatic serpent boss, Batwoon. Upper Meridia is characterized mainly by sandstone that is overgrown with green foliage. This overwater subsection's similarity to Criteria is even greater, with the two areas connected by a passage only accessible through the wrecked ship. A few space pirates hang out here, and a statue in the area rewards Samus with Plasma Beam. I probably missed a few creatures here and there in this attempt at a comprehensive field guide, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. And if you want to see me cover the flora and fauna of the other planets in the Metroid series, let me know that down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my donors who allow me to bring on outside talent like editors to make more high quality content for you to enjoy. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Any objections, lady?